you guys. Remember that. So who here this week had a chance to sow good seed into somebody? Awesome. Awesome. Did it feel good? It felt good. It felt good. You know, I've kind of went back and forth on what, what to talk about today. And, uh, and uh, turns out they're going to kind of get merged together. So it may seem like they don't have anything to do with one another. Hang with me, they would. So, I want to start off by telling a story. I like stories. You can't get mad at a story. Everybody understands a story. That's why Jesus used them a lot. So, I want you to imagine that you read an ad in the newspaper, and the ad in the newspaper says, Hey, I will give a free $100 bill to anybody that sends me self-addressed stamp pound or whatever. How many people would do that? How many people, if they said, hey, you send me a self-addressed stamped envelope, I will send you a free $100 bill? Show of hands, who would do that? Okay. <laughs> so let me hear some reasons why you would, for those that would. Why would you? Uh, for me, honestly, it's just a huge risk that there's just so much un, like dishonesty in the world that I just don't believe that. Okay, don't believe it, don't trust it. I think it was a scam. Yeah, exactly. Scam. I think it was a scam. Scam. It's a murder trying to figure out where you live, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go through so I many, you see so things all the time about sex trafficking and stuff. And we've got a little girl that lives with us. I mean, I don't want to risk her. So, the majority of people here wouldn't do it because they didn't trust it. They didn't believe it. Too good to be true. For the, the several people that raised their hands, they send it in. A week later, they get $100 in the mail. What do you feel now? For those that didn't send it in. I'm a little jealous, but let's go out to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Your treat, right? <laughs> so you see... Somebody offered in the mail a completely free gift. No strings attached because she got it a week later. Completely free gift, no strings attached. Would you agree with that? She got the $100, that's it. Nobody ever talks to her again. It's a free gift, right? But they're not asking for anything. You never hear from them. You go your entire life, you never hear from them again. That would be a free gift with nothing attached, right? But even though it's a free gift, and even though there was no re attachments to it, did it not still have a requirement? Yeah, that's what I was about to say. It wasn't free because you had to pay the 42 cent stamp. It had a requirement. It cost you something. Okay? Remember this story. So, who has a Bible? We're going to start in Luke 14. Luke is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Center of the Bible, go right. You should find it. I really need to get a bigger iPad. Or glasses? Yeah, no, I'm not doing glasses. So, in Luke 14, we'll start in verse 26. It says, If anyone comes to me, this is Jesus speaking, all right? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. We'll turn back here because I got mine divided. And the next slide. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? 
lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man did begin to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he would be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. That threw me off guard. That was in the old English. I don't use that too often. <laughs> so this is where I want to start with. So, does anybody have anything out of the scripture that catches you off guard. Do what? The first part. The first part? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his mother and father, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. In the Arabic and Greek languages, because this threw me off too for a while. Um, we preach that Jesus is a God of love, and now he's saying that if you don't hate these people, you can't even be my disciple. How many people here are fluent in Arabic or Greek? Raise your hand. Oh. <laughs> All right, well then you'll have to take my word for it. <laughs> How many people have ever heard that the Arabic and Greek languages are passionate languages? that they're extreme languages. In Arabic, there is no moderate words. There is no word for somebody come up and say, hey, how was your day? To say, ah, it was okay. In Arabic, you either have a good day, a great day, or a bad day, an awful day. There's, there's no word in between. It's a language of, of much contrast. Um, you'll see it also, where uh, in Luke 16, he says, No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate one and love the other, or be loyal to one and disloyal to the other. See, the point he's trying to make here is that if you're serving two masters, you're going to love one more than the other. You're going to like one more than the other. You're going to preference one more than the other. Therefore, you can't be true to both of them. Because you're going to be more loyal. You're going to love one. He's not. When we go back to the Old Testament and we look at Jacob, there's a story in the Old Testament where Jacob falls in love with this, this girl and he wants to marry her. He goes to the father and he says, Hey, I really want to marry this girl, your daughter, Rachel. And the guy's like, okay, fine. You know what? Work for me for seven years, and then I'll, I'll let you marry my daughter. And so he's like, okay. And so he goes, and he works for him for seven years. And then he's like, time for the wedding. He gets up there. They have the wedding veil. He marries. Turns out the man had put the wrong daughter up there. He had put his oldest daughter. He had married not the woman that he loved. And so he gets upset about this. He goes to the man and he's like, look, this is the woman that I love. is your younger daughter. And he's like, okay, well, I'll tell you what. Work for me another seven years and then you can marry her. And so he does. He works for another seven years and then he marries Rachel, the one that he loves. That ends us here at this scripture that I'm going to read. In Genesis 29, 30 and 31. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet another seven years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, and Rachel was buried. So we see here that it says that Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. But then it quotes, God saw that Leah was hated. It's just the way that they word things. When God says that you must hate your mother, your father, your wife, your daughter, your sister, or you're not worthy to be my disciple, 
Here what Jesus is saying is you must love me more than your wife. You must love me more than your husband. You must love me more than your daughter, than your son. Everybody follow me on that? Everybody agree? Anybody disagree? We, we cool with that? So this is the first part of that scripture. Now what happens is Jesus has been speaking. He's got a multitude following him. All right? Thousands of people are following him. And he stops and he turns and he looks at him and he says, Hey guys, unless you're willing to love me more than your mother and father, unless you're willing to love me more than your husband and your wife, unless you're willing to love me more than your children, you can't be my disciple. And so he's telling that to this multitude following him, wanting to be a disciple. And he says, you've got to love me more than anybody else in this world. Or you can't be my disciple. So then we go into verse 27. And this is Jesus speaking again. And he says, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. How many people know what that phrase means? You know, we all say, well, we have a cross to bear. You know. How many have heard that phrase? It's a common phrase that we use, but I don't think we truly understand the gravity of it because when he was speaking this, the cross that you bear meant that you were about to die. Plain and simple. You were bearing a cross to go to the most horrible death imaginable. You suffocated over a period of about three days. And here, Jesus looks at him. He's already told him, if you don't love me more than everybody else, then you can't be my disciple. And here he's looking at him and basically telling him, and if you don't love me more than you love your own life, you cannot be my disciple. I follow this. So he's got this crowd following him. And the very first two things he says to them is, look, you've got to love me more than everybody else out there. You've got to love me more than yourself. And then in verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost? Whether he has enough to finish it. At least after he has laid the foundation and is able and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with ten thousand to meet him who comes against him with twenty thousand? So this crowd is following Jesus. He stops, he turns around, he looks at them. And he says, look, if you don't love me more than everybody else in this world, you cannot be my disciple. If you don't love me more than you love yourself, you cannot be my disciple. You need to stop and think about this before you follow me even further. Isn't that what he's saying here? You're following me because you're part of a crowd. You're following me because it's the end thing to do. You're following me because everybody around you is following me right now. But I'm telling you to stop and count the cost before you take another step. Because at this point, it's going to cost you loving me more than everybody in your life. And loving me more than yourself. And he doesn't stop there. He ends it with, so likewise... Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's kind of a harsh statement, is it not? If you don't leave everything that you own, everything that you possess, you cannot be my disciple. I think he's pretty much covered everything. If you don't love him more than everybody in your life, if 
you don't love Him more than you love yourself, if you don't love Him more than you love everything in your life, you cannot be His disciple. It's not my words. I'm reading, I'm reading His words. We have two examples of both situations there. One we know pretty, pretty good. Jesus walks up to Peter. Peter's fishing and he's like, hey, come with me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Peter stands up. He leaves. We know that Peter had a wife. He walks away from his family. He walks away from his business. He walks away from everything that he owns. And he goes and he follows Jesus for three and a half years. Peter was a disciple. Then we have the story of another guy. So, in your Bibles, let's turn to Luke 18. And we're going to start in verse 18. And this is the video that we watched. The rich young ruler. I don't know if anybody caught that, but... That's who he was portraying. It was the rich young ruler that came up to Jesus. And this is the text of it. In verse 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? None is good save one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not... Bear false witness. Honor your mother and your father. And he said unto him, These things I have kept from my youth. Now Jesus heard these things, and he said unto him, Yet you lack one thing. Sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sad, for he was very rich. So we have the rich young ruler who has done everything. He's kept the commandments. He's lived a good life. But there's that one thing in his life that he just doesn't want to let go of. For him it was possessions. You know, the example I gave with the $100 represents salvation. There's a free gift there. Nothing you can do to earn it. Nothing you can do to justify yourself for it. Nothing you can do to qualify yourself for it. Just like the $100 bill in the mail, the only reason that Miss Ann would get $100 in the mail is because she believed in it and she done the requirements for it. There's absolutely nothing you can do to earn your salvation, but salvation comes with requirements. Are awful quiet. You know, Jesus himself even said he came with requirements. Does anybody know of one requirement that Jesus gave? Don't overthink it. You must believe in him. That's one of the requirements. Ask. Repentance. You know, it's not a popular subject because right now the, the most popular subject is salvation is free, it costs you nothing. All you have to do is accept it and go. There's a lot of truth to that. But all of you would like $100. But only two of y'all walk out of here with $100. Why? Because only three of you believe. Only two truly believed. Believed it enough to act on it. Believed it enough to say, hey, you know what? I'll send them a self-addressed envelope. I'll do that. Everybody wants it. You know, there's a story of a guy that rides a bike across a tight wire. And so he's, he's like three stories up, tight wire stretched in between two buildings. There's a crowd forming below and he yells down at him, he says, how many people believe that I could ride this bike across the tight wire? And like, out of a hundred people down there, two people raise their hands. 
It's like, all right. So he rides the bike across the night park. Crowd cheers, you know. They're excited. He says, now how many people believe I could ride it back across? Well, about half the people raise their hand now. So he rides it back across. How many people believe I could ride it backwards? About three quarters of the people raise their hand. He rides it backwards. How many people believe I can do it blindfolded? He rides it. And so finally, every question he asks, the crowd 100% say, yes, we believe you can do it. So he gets the bike to the one side, and everybody believes that he can ride across it. Everybody believes that he can do it blindfolded. Everybody believes he can do it backwards. And he says, how many people believe I can ride this bike across with somebody <laughs> on the handlebars? And everybody's like, yeah, we believe you can. He says, who wants to volunteer? <laughs> Nobody raises their hand. So how many people truly believed he can do it? See, a lot of people believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in him. A lot of people have a head knowledge of him, and they believe in him, and they believe that there's a God, and they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but they don't believe in him. <laughs> they don't believe in him enough to fulfill the requirements. There's absolutely nothing you can do to earn salvation. But there are steps you have to take to receive it. Even if I were to offer a free gift right here, no strings attached, come get it, it's yours forever. You would still have to get up out of your seat, walk up here, take it in your hands. There's a requirement. I say the requirement's small. Jesus says it's the biggest requirement you're ever going to fulfill because it's going to cost you your life. It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you every relationship, your mom, your dad, your wife, your sister. Not that you have to walk away from them, but you have to love him more than you love them. It's going to cost you your own self. You know? <clears throat> Put this into practical words. Because it's easy to say, yeah, I love Jesus more than I love people in my life. Yeah, I love Jesus more than I love me. Yeah, I love Jesus more than I love my stuff. If you walked out that door right now and you heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say, you know what? I want you to give away everything you own to the first person you come in contact with. Could you do it? Would you do it? Or would you say, no, you know what? Just like the rich young ruler. I've done everything else. Why are you going to request this of me? You know? The whole point behind today's message, the whole point of what I'm talking about, how horrible would it feel for us sitting in here? We teach love. We teach acceptance. We teach that we're going to accept everybody. That we're going to receive everybody and we're going to treat them equally. That we're going to treat them the same. But I don't want anybody to ever misinterpret love and acceptance with salvation. Because I don't know your heart. I don't know where you're at. And all I've done today is just put out a benchmark for you of three things. Because when this is over, if we had standing room only in here and people felt loved and people felt accepted and people felt part of our family but we all died and went to hell what have we done? you know I do love everybody here and like I said I don't know your heart I don't know where anybody's at but I know even for myself, this is a hard standard to measure yourself against. You know? I mean, the Bible says that a good man will lay down his life for another good man. But would you lay down your life for an unworthy person? If Jesus asked you to give your life to save the life 
of somebody that we deem unworthy. Do you love Jesus enough to say, okay, I'll do it? Because to be a disciple, you have to. Case in point, every disciple except for John did. Laid down their life for people that sought to kill them for no other reason than they were followers of Jesus. You know, we talk about being disciples and we talk about, uh, a lot of times I feel I'm guilty of teaching how to mimic the actions of somebody who's in love with Jesus. So today we're taking a step back and we're going to teach you how to fall in love with Jesus. Because if your heart is truly in love with Jesus, these things are easy. These things are easy. If you're truly in love with Jesus, you're going to want to sow good seed into everybody you come in contact with. If you're truly in love with Jesus, you're going to want to hear those nudges and act on them. You know, I always give challenges. And so my challenge today is this week when you go home, I want you to meditate on this. And I want you to think about it. You know, if asked, could I give away my house? Could I give away my car? Could I give away my gun collection? Could I give away fill in the blank? You know? Could I walk away from my family if Jesus called me to go someplace else? Could I lay down my life? This is my friend that I haven't seen in a while. Could I lay down my life if that's what Jesus asked of me? Could I really do it? And I want, you to, I want you to dwell on that. I want, you to, I want you to count the cost. As Jesus said, before you follow me, count the cost. Before you take one more step, stop and count the cost. That's what he's telling this multitude that's following. And that's what I'm asking you today. Before we go forward, let's count the cost. Is this the direction that we truly want to go? I can tell you, if you're like me, a lot of y'all in counting the cost are going to be like, well, daggum, I don't know if I can give away my car. I just got it. It's convertible. It's summertime. I love it. You know, I don't know if I could give away my house. I don't know if I could walk away from my family. For those of you that come to that conclusion, I came to that conclusion. Everybody comes to that conclusion at some point in time. Plant a seed in yourself. We talked about planting seeds last week. And what is a seed? Who remembers what planting a seed is? Oh, I stink at my job. Not that. <laughs> With it's expectations of growth. It's a thought. It's just a thought. You're planting a thought in somebody. You know? You're planting a thought in somebody that they dwell on and they meditate on. And that thought begins to grow. And their life begins to change because of that thought that you plant, because of that seed that you planted in. So when you start to count the cost this week and you come to the conclusion, you know what? Maybe I don't love Jesus more than I love my wife. Maybe I don't love Jesus more than I love my children. Instead of letting the devil come in like a flood and say, you see, you're not even worthy to be a disciple. You're not even worried to be there. You should just give it up and quit and walk away from it now. Because that's what the enemy wants to do. How about you plant a seed? And when you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror, you plant that seed and you say, Jesus, I love you more than I love my family. Jesus, I love you more than I love anything that I own here on earth. Jesus, I love you more than I even love myself. When you go to eat lunch, most of us will stop and we'll take a five second and bless the food. Don't do that this week. Instead of blessing the food, why don't you say, Jesus, I love you more than I love anything in my life. And start to plant that seed, whatever it may be. You know? And it may be something stupid. Because let me tell you a, a little story. 
kind of get a smile on people's faces because you're all way too somber, is, believe it or not, me and Kim grew up kind of dirt poor when we got married. We didn't have much of anything. We were constantly borrowing money from all awesome parents. We didn't have a whole lot. We didn't have nice things growing up. And Kim had managed to get one of these uh, KitchenAid mixers. Okay? A nice mixer. All right? And it was a, a sense of, hey, I'm finally making it somewhere. I got a KitchenAid mixer. We got it, we got it from a garage sale. You know, it was used. But it was a nice mixer. All right. And somebody mentioned, hey, I'm going to start a baking thing down in Escataba. And Kim felt the Holy Spirit say, I want you to give her this mixer. And that was something that Kim battled over for weeks. She had gave away a car. She had gave away a house. She gave away, but the mixer was something. It wasn't a mod, it was It was a symbol to her. It was something that she had always wanted. And it took her a while before she finally came to grips with it and said, okay, I'm going to be obedient to you, Lord. And she gave it away. Probably about a week. And, uh, yeah. And somebody we went to church with, I know lost her name, and everybody that went to church with us is not in here. I don't know where they disappeared to. Uh, but yeah, it was, a, it was a young couple and she was starting a bakery okay. in, in Escatada. Um, and when Kim gave it to her, you know, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to give away this prize possession to somebody, you know, and you expect this, oh, thank you so much, oh, it's awesome, you know, and she was like, oh, thanks. And that makes it feel even worse. That makes it feel like, damn, why did I give this? They don't even appreciate it. They don't even deserve it. Why am I doing it? You're not doing it for them. You're doing it because the Holy Spirit asked you to do it. You know. So whatever it is, when you start counting the cost this week, it may not be anything major. It may be something small like a mixer. And if that's what it is, this week as you start to pray, Jesus, I love you more than I love that mixer. Begin to plant a seed in there. Jesus, I love you more than I love my own life. And as we plant these seeds and as they begin to grow, you'll see that these things do become easier and easier and easier. Everybody follow me on this? Yes? Yep. Before I dismiss you Two things. If you're in a position today that like, I've never counted the cost. I've always followed the crowd. And you really want to meet Jesus for the first time. You really want to be a disciple. You want to step up. Then after service, come see me. We'll walk through the requirements. They're not many. They're very simple. He says, my burden is light. It's true. But there are requirements. You have to choose to follow Him. There are steps you have to make. My second one is, anybody need prayer today? For anything? Everybody's good? Any questions? Any concerns? How many people are going to count the cost this week? Well, let me pray for y'all. Father, Father, I ask that your Spirit would just go with each and every person here. Holy Spirit, that you would begin to deal with them, that you would soften hearts, that you would open minds, you would open eyes. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would encourage each and every person here, that there would be an excitement and a joy and a love for you, that their love for you would be multiplied that it would be expanded. And Holy Spirit, that you would use them to be blessings and miracles to everybody that you come in contact with this week. We ask this in Jesus' name.